half in the bag. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Hey, Slameel, Slamazel, Haas and Pfeffer Incorporated. What the fuck are you doing? I was singing the theme song to Laverne and Sherlin's. What? Everything you're saying is wrong, because I was not singing a theme song to a TV show that came out 60 years before our audience was even born. Why else would you be saying numbers? Because I was counting these invoices. Invoices? Yeah, it looks like our weird friend Rich has been really busy lately. Mike ate John. Jobs in the six months or whatever we've been gone isn't that impressive. Jay, these are all in one week. Hey, do you want to see Green Room? Oh, sure. Okay, I'm with the Eight Rights from Washington, D.C. You guys are hard to find. Why no social media presence? The music is shared live. It's time and aggression. You gotta be there. Sorry guys, we gotta clear out. Follow me. And then it's over. Green Room is the third feature film from Jeremy Saunier, the director of Murder Party and Blue Ruin. In this film, Anton Yelchin stars as a member of a punk rock band that gets in over their heads when they witness a murder backstage at a club run by violent skinheads. The leader of the skinhead organization is everyone's favorite bald guy, Patrick Stewart. Patrick Stewart? Anton Yelchin? That's right, it's Chekhov versus Picard. We're getting those Star Trek references out of the way right up front, motherfucker. Mike, was Star Trek all you were going to talk about? Whoever that fucker was who read the intro stole my thunder. I don't know who it was. I don't know who reads these intros. I've been waiting years to say punk rock Chekhov versus Nazi Picard. And, and, and not, it wasn't Walter Koenig. It was Anton Yelchin, the Chekhov from the alternate timeline J.J. Abrams universe. It was a clash of universes, Jay. This is fanfic overload. It was, it was... Picard was brainwashed in a different dimension. It's like the episode where Benjamin Sisko is, is a crime writer in the 1940s on Star Trek Deep Space Nine! Was that a plot line? I think so. There's many episodes of many series of Star Trek where one of the characters is out of time, out of place, in, uh, in a different world where their memories are wiped and they're doing something completely different that normally do and so-and-so is a bad guy. There's of course the Mirror, Mirror Universe in Star, Star Trek, the original series, and which carries over into Deep Space Nine. Oh, of course. They bring back the Mirror, Mirror Universe in Deep Space Nine, yeah. where everyone's fucked up and evil. And some people are, most people are. Um, and so I, I, the whole time I watched this film, I was just, I was just thinking like, this is great. This is a great Star Trek episode. Is that what you were thinking? Yeah, I kept I kept wanting to hear Patrick Stewart say, "Throw the phaser under the door." <laughs> uh, oh, also that's the, it. Yeah, that's our <laughs> review. Uh, but what did you think of Green Room? Well, let me ask you this: You have not seen Blue Ruin, right? I don't think I want to. Okay, well, this well, movie Blue ruined my day. <laughs> What are you talking about? This is the, the feel-good movie of the summer. Feels good like shingles. <laughs> uh, this may be one of the first movies I've loved and hated at the same time. Okay. Uh, not, not hated in the uh, sense that I thought it was bad, but in the sense that it's a miserable, miserable fucking movie. Miserable and intense. Miserable, intense. And filled with kind of inept characters. Inept characters, yeah, on both sides. Yeah. And all around, like, I don't know, I would call it sadistic? Mm. Depressingly sadistic? I, I don't know if I would go so far as to call it sadistic. It's, it's violent, but the violence never feels gratuitous. Like, it always feels like it, it's being used, I mean, it's, it gets pretty graphic in parts, but it's always used in a way that just ups the intensity of what's happening, where it's like it really makes you understand how severe the situation is. Oh yeah, I mean the film, the film is very well done. It looks great, it has a, a, a great sense of uh, dread and uncomfortableness to it. Um, it. It Actually I was thinking when I was watching it, it felt like a really good TV show. 
I don't know. It was just something about it where we always complain that movies like suck. <laughs> And that, well, it's true. They do a lot of times. And that certain TV series, you know, you got your Breaking Bads, uh, The Killing, uh, Broadchurch, uh, you know, Sons of Anarchy. That's a little more schlockier. But you got shows like that that are really intense dramas. Fargo. Fargo. I, Fargo. I have not watched Fargo, that so I can't. Fucking great. I can't vouch for it. Fargo, um, things like that, where it, it really is like intense and well done, and movies that we watch are just like trash so I was like oh this is you know this is really good but um, uh, you gotta be in a mood you gotta be in a mood to watch a movie like this I, I didn't know I, I knew the premise the premise um, well we should mention this movie is not a wide release movies a lot of people probably have no idea what we're talking it's, it's about it's wider release than I was expecting it to be I thought it was gonna be like you know, the coasts and a couple little theaters here and there. So I was really happy when I found out it came to our area because I, this was, for me, this was the movie I was looking forward to most this year. Well, you love this sort of stuff, this sort of vile, depraved, sadistic, violence. When it's done well, I don't like those stupid ass Saw movies or things like well, that. Well, yeah. I mean, that's, that's the one element. Like, I probably would have complained if the movie had funny moments in it or lighthearted moments where it kind of didn't take itself that seriously. Um, it, it just plays it straight the whole time and it's, it's a miserable experience. <laughs> it's a, a beautifully well-crafted miserable experience. Yes. You're trapped. <laughs> Things have gone south. It won't end well. You can't keep us here, man. You gotta let us go. We're not keeping you. You're just staying. Shoot who is left. Blood and bleed. Well, well, coming into this, because uh, I've seen Blue Ruin, I love Blue Ruin. It's it's one of my favorite movies of the last few years, which is why I was really looking forward to this. And I think I, I really, really liked this movie a lot. I, I may grow to love it on repeat viewings, but on initial viewing, I, w I would watch this again because I guess I'm a crazy person. You need that release. I'm, I'm not a miserable person in general, so seeing movies like this, you know, it puts you in a different mindset. But uh, I'd seen Blue Ruin, so seeing Blue Ruin and knowing how Blue Ruin operates and then seeing this movie, uh, it, it kind of made this movie less interesting because what Blue Ruin does great, and this movie does the same thing, and after a while that starts to become a little predictable, which is that it it's constantly subverting what you would normally expect from a thriller or from the situations in a movie like this, some sort of like dark crime, mm. gritty thing. So after a while, you start to understand the mechanics of it. Like when something's going to happen, you're like, okay, I see what they're leading up to, so that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So as this movie goes along, after having seen Blue Ruin, that starts to become more obvious, which the subversion starts to feel more predictable, if that makes sense. Mm. My brain can process what a normal movie would do, so this movie's not going to do that. So what you're saying is before you see this miserable movie, don't see the other miserable movie. Well, you can see both of them because they're both incredibly well made and they're both great movies in their own right, but this one made me really hope that whatever uh, Jeremy Sonier does next is a completely different type of movie because I, I get what he's doing now. And by the end of this movie, it was like, okay, I, I understand your gimmicks. They're not not gimmicks, but just mm. the way he. The way gimmicks he is a harsh word. It, it's a harsh word. I don't. I shouldn't say gimmicks, but the way he he. It's manipulates. very close to the word grimace, which is a big purple monster from Ronald McDonald's asshole. Mm -hmm. I, I like movies where characters are trapped in a situation and they have to figure their way out of it. Mm -hmm. I really like movies like very, that. Very small and Where contained. you're like, okay, what, what would I do in this situation? I, that's when I like really get involved in a movie like uh, Cube or oh, movies yeah. like that where you're like, um, okay, uh, yeah, break through the floor. Uh, you know, try to break through the drywall. Why aren't they going through the ceiling? You know, yeah. oh, they tried that, but there's a thing in the way. And, and I like stuff like that. What, what would my next strategy be? But overall, it's, it was like, 
I, I enjoyed the first the first act, right? Where there's there's this miserable band on tour, and they're just like. I loved all the punk rock stuff. It was oh yeah, so, it you felt tell, authentic. It felt authentic. You could tell the the, the filmmaker understands this world. Yes, uh, the the uh, uh, Dead Kennedys T-shirts and the minor threats. And without it, without it being too in your face. Where, yeah, it like, was, and that's what I liked because I, I, you see so many movies that try and have like punk rock characters or any sort of like subgenre of you know yes. of people where it's it's so. Uh, like on the nose mm -hmm. and so obvious and yeah. this one it's all just handled it's really understated the 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 miserable band in their tour bus and Anton Yelchin I guess was like he wanted to keep it real and they're releasing their stuff on records they don't do social media and they had that <laughs> little, I guess that little element was like so that it was harder to it made the the threat of them being captured more ominous because oh, sure. no one knew where they were but yeah the the whole world that they built with the the bad show in the bar in the beginning with like three people there and yeah. they had to steal gasoline and all that. But then, you know, they get to this club and the premise is they, uh, they are locked in the green room by this, this white supremacist club owner who, who apparently has murdered before and is covering up a murder this time, and they get involved and in, entangled in this whole plot. And there's people that are defecting, going to the police, and there's a, this, it's a, I was wondering if it was supposed to be a horror movie or a cr crime thriller. It, it I, this really is kind a of, thriller. It really transcended a bunch of different genres there. It, it could it, it execute in a different way. It could be more of a straightforward thriller, or it could be a full-on horror yeah. movie. Uh, Moral of the story. <laughs> uh, Bad things happen, man. That's it. <laughs> it's a mad, 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 <laughs> mad, mad world. It's it's about the experience, like you said. It's the the what would I do in this situation? And I and I like that the characters are not. It's not like they start off sort of in over their heads and slowly throughout the movie they, they become a little more clever and a little more adept at handling it. They never get a whole lot better because you would no. not. Uh, in movies that happens, but in real life, you would be clumsy and awkward and inept the whole way through. And, Until and you they, uh, uh, paint more, more paint on your face. <laughs> That's just punk rock, man. Do, do uh, <laughs> some wild shit. I, I don't know. There's a little hint of... Um, uh, the, the uh, mid '90s ish, like shock, shock movie, Tarantino esque, yeah. very bad things. Like here's a movie with bleh, a bunch of fucking shit happens. But that that always bleh. feels slightly uh, exploitational is not the right word, but sensational, I guess. And a little over the top, and this mm. didn't really feel like that. This just felt like the violence was being used in a way where. It's shocking, but it's shocking in the way it would be if you were in that situation. Yeah, and, and that's why this felt more like a horror movie and less like a crime movie mm. because it, it, it was more, I don't know, it had, it had a different feel to it where a horror movie is, is generally just kind of like senseless violence. A crime movie usually has, I mean, this did have a little storyline with the, the bad guy, Patrick Stewart, but it really just felt like Characters that are normal people in a, in a terrifying situation who are being killed off, and and the, it felt like a blend of horror and and crime, hmm. in, as far as genres go. But pinpointing the genre isn't really the point. The point of us discussing the Green Room and having watched it is what we thought of it, and you loved it. I, I liked it a lot. I didn't quite love it just because it, it felt like. Tonally, stylistically, uh, as far as the violence and the subversion of things, it, it felt a little too close to Blue Ruin. I would like to have seen something a little more, because Blue Ruin felt so fresh and different, and this feels like more of the same. Get ready to run. Here we go. Careful now. Were you distracted at all by Patrick Stewart being the TNG fan that you are? Um, no. I'd say he's slightly underutilized. He's in a fair amount of the movie, but 
He's he doesn't. Dead. He doesn't have a lot to do other than just like talk to the other characters. That's the thing. It's like that's, it reminded me a little of uh, Schwarzenegger in uh, Maggie, mm. where Schwarzenegger, of course, is the destroyer man, and he was very soft. Patrick Stewart has r real dramatic range, and this whole movie he mumbled. Yeah. And he, I, I wanted that really good scene where he got pissed at, at his his underlings or, at the band or had some really kind of like, ranting speech about, like, uh, uh, neo Nazism or whatever the fuck he was into, <laughs> or, or you know he was just very, um, very quiet. Yeah, I mean that clearly was deliberate, but well, yeah, that was the character. You, you want to, yeah, Patrick Stewart in this type of role. I yeah. was like, oh man, he's gonna have some great scenes, and I mean he's great in the movie, but. It, it's very understated in a way where I would have liked to have seen him yeah. have a little more to do. Patrick Stewart was very, very methodical with his uh, attempts to cover up and, and even kill people. Yeah. And I just, I want a little passion. I want a little acting from Patrick Stewart. I mean, it's there. It's, it's, it's more subdued and it's really subtle in the ways that you can tell that he's sort of disappointed with his, his group and how it's not as well oiled a machine as maybe he thought it was. Yeah, but I they're like, just I like, like those aspects of it. Rednecks in the in in Seattle. Oh, sure, and that's why you can sense that disappointment where he's like, "This is all I got," you know. Yeah, they, they were just like they were. It was a, it was a it was a, a a talentless, filthy, pathetic band going nowhere, and a bunch of slimy, racist guys in in the backwoods of uh, the Pacific Northwest, like despicable, ugly characters and then they all killed each other <laughs> you know what i mean there was no I think like you're oversimplifying it a bit well the no that's characters... good though okay. that's what i like oh okay it wasn't I like you're trying to say that in a bad way here, here's the here's the the the, the, the negative the, the the negative i mean negative positive inversion of it sure. we're we're a we're a happy band we're going on we're gonna make it we're gonna make it we bought this van everybody oh good luck everybody you're gonna get travels down to, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, redneck country, and then you have like the toothless southerners, and then you have, um, uh, what's the squeal like a pig movie, deliverance, deliverance kind of situation. Yeah. And then it's like, where it's like cartoony elements. This was, this was uh, it felt very real, and it yeah. felt very gross. What you're describing is the Eli Roth version of this movie. Exactly, <laughs> I, I thought of Eli Roth a little with infusing the the comedy or the over the top kind of stuff because you mentioned another movie with green in the title green inferno oh the yeah cannibal the movie, green inferno where you said there were people were farting while their guts were being ripped out and yes stuff like that. yes like and i did not lack of tone did not want that no one was really a good guy i mean obviously anton yelchin is our protagonist in the film he's the most one we could relate to the most yeah um but everyone's just there and it's miserable and and it's awful and it's uh, uh it's something to experience yeah well it doesn't work for every movie because some movies you want them to feel more like movies but for something like mm -hmm. this everyone just because people aren't th that easily definable or that's uh specific so it's right. just it just feels like normal people yes uh not the most intelligent not the dumbest it's just a bunch of average people mm -hmm. i love the scene early on when they're being interviewed by the dude with the mohawk for his, his college uh, mm -hmm. radio program or whatever it is, and they're doing it in this shitty little punk rock apartment, and like the way everybody's talking and the way the, the, the scene is handled and the way the performance is, where everyone's just sort of like, they sound like mumbly and sedated, and everybody just feels so believable. If you've ever seen the documentary The Decline of Western Civilization, these, all these characters feel like they were just plucked right out of that. And we die. How long can we wait? For sure that is. Is that a pep talk? Just grab some shit, get ready to run. Here we go. I see the band on the horizon. Another thing that I liked was one of the band members, I, there's a singer and the drummer. I'm getting them confused. Sure. But, um, when they're locked in the room and they're the big fat guys holding them with the gun, like, I'm not supposed to let you out of here. At one point, it's kind of like, not introduced, but he uses like 
like a wrestling move or, or karate moves to kind of pin him. Yeah. And he's like, I know how to do this. And they never established that. Hmm. And, and I like that. It's well, like, why would they? Well, the characters know that he probably would know that. Because so. a, a, a stupid movie would. Exactly. I got to make it back in time for my karate finals, everyone. <laughs> We've got to be over with this tour by next week because my karate finals <laughs> are coming up. The karate championship, which I'm trained in. It's just sort of like a thing that that character knew how to how to do a chokehold and how to break a guy's arm with a with a move. And um, it's just like, okay, that guy knows that. Yeah. And the movie didn't need to tell us that. And I, I, there were little things like that that were smart in the script. And so uh, there was lots of little stuff like that. And I think that's what made it feel authentic was because you throw characters in situations like this and they try whatever they can and they leave it all in. The, the, the script writing rule is every little thing should come into play or have pay off or make sense in some way. Yeah. But sometimes that's not always true. Right. right? And you don't always have to set everything up. The, the counterbalance to that is sometimes it will feel like shit just comes out of nowhere and doesn't make sense. Sometimes it'll feel organic. It just depends on the talent of the script writer or the filmmaker. So in this case, it worked. I think you're being a hypocrite because sometimes you say that everything that's set up needs to pay off, but now you're saying things just d don't pay off, so, so you're, you're being a hypocrite. You gotta learn. Because every, every movie, if you have a criticism about one movie, that applies to every single movie regardless of what that movie is trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. So you're a hypocrite. It's, it's a hard science from <laughs> criticism. It's, it is, it is. It's not a soft science, it's a hard science. <laughs> It's like chemistry. Every time, every time, yes, exactly the same. Because mm -hmm. we're not evaluating works of art. No, we're just uh, we're plugging in numbers. We're like mathematicians. That's what film is. Two plus two equals four. Every time. Always. Always. <laughs> this movie worked. It made me want to throw up, <laughs> but it worked. It's a rigged endorsement. It made me want to cry and <laughs> commit suicide and take a shower all at the same time. It's great! I see trouble on the way. They're everywhere! You breathing? Love and bleed. Well, Jay, would you recommend Green Room. Uh, absolutely to certain people. Not if you don't uh, want to oh, feel... You sound like me. Well, I mean, this is the case. Like, Not everyone's going to want to feel the feelings that this movie gives you. Not everyone's going to want that experience of, of dark, violent, uh, uh, horrible feeling in the pit of your stomach on, on edge. Uh, people like thrillers. They like sort of the roller coaster ride type movies. I like but thriller. this one... Thriller. Thriller. Well, usually I have the caveat with the, you know, I don't let grandma watch this movie. You know, watch it if you are a depraved, sadistic, nihilistic, uh, sex pervert like you. Sure. Um, don't, grandma don't go watch this. It's not about the green room backstage at the Dick Cavett show. Mm. Um, it, it's, uh, it's not something for grandma. It's not something... There are no minions in it. No. Uh, it's, it's not uh, a good, good first date film. It's a good last date film. It's a good last date yeah. film. Yeah. Uh, but I think, I think generally my, my recommendation would lean, might lean towards no. Yeah. Just, just in the... Just like, because of the, the tone and nature of the we're, movie? We're, we're, it's safe to say we're cinephiles as the expression goes, right? Sure. Um, and I loved the look of it, and it's an experience, but it's a very, very slim audience. You mentioned not recommended to grandma, and I was thinking, this is the first movie we've seen in a while where there wasn't an elderly person in the theater. Every movie we see that's a miserable nightmare, there's always an old person in the theater, and I always just feel so bad for them. Usually they just, like, get up. <laughs> <start walking out. laughs> yep. Oh. Not for me. Yeah. No. That didn't happen this time. Gotta get my refund. The movie where they would have gotten up and left the quickest, and it, they weren't there. Mm. 
I think grandparents don't know about this movie. That's the problem. Well, they're all in the theater over watching Mother's Day starring Jennifer Aniston. See, I think that movie would make me sick much easier than Green Room. That, talk about a depraved, sadistic, <laughs> psychopathic nightmare. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's fucking hard, man. You know what's weird? What? After our discussion of the movie, my beer magically refilled itself. Oh my goodness. Hmm. Well, after watching the movie with such horrific violence, I cannot wait till that fucker Rich comes back here. I'm gonna slaughter him like a pig. I'm gonna cut his fucking belly open with a box cutter. Is that wise? I mean, he is doing all the work. That's a good thing, right? Hmm, could be, I don't know. Hmm. He's doing a good job, is it? Wait a minute. This one says it was done by a butch. Who's butch? Hello? Oh, hi, Tim. How are you doing? That's right, Tim. Me and Jay are back and ready to work. Hey, wait a minute, Tim. I thought you gave the store to us right before you flew through the ceiling. What's that you say, Tim? You bought it back after we went missing on the mountaintop? Oh, that makes sense. What, Tim? You have four employees now, but you only need two. <laughs> Don't worry, Tim. Jay and I will take care of it. Okay, thanks, Tim. Goodbye, Tim. Who is that? I have no idea. I couldn't understand a thing he was saying. It sounded like you could understand him. Hey, I have tickets to see an advanced screening of Captain America Civil War. You want to go? Oh, yeah. All right, let's go. Butch, it's time. Oh. Yeah, yeah, hi, uh, Miss Johnson is uh, Butch home. Oh, no. Oh. Uh, no, I've been doing fine. No, no, no. Could you could you leave a message for uh, Butch for me? Yeah, yeah, no, just tell him it's time. Oh, he'll know. Thank you. How was, how was the bridge meeting last Tuesday? Did you, have, did you win? I know you had the bridge group. Were the old ladies in town? That's, that's not you who does that? Oh, well, that's, well, that's horribly awkward for me to ask that then. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I, got, I gotta go. No, my knees are just hurting. I'm, I'm just kneeling on the ground. Look, I just gotta go. Just, just remember to tell them, it's time. Well, I know it doesn't make much sense to you because you don't know the rest of the story. Look, it's this whole thing going on with me and Butch, Mrs. Johnson. Just let him know, all right? Jesus Christ! <sighs> Together, Grimace, we could own this town. <laughs> <laughs> 